Thank you, Aldous. I'm gonna continue presenting. Cool. Okay, so I'm gonna be speaking more on the detection of the fungus, um, which is obviously very important um, because it's such a, a major pathogen. Um, and firstly, I just wanna discuss why it's important um, to detect. So firstly, in this picture, you will see there's a variety of images. There's some soil, plant material, a tractor, and um, water. And these are all ways in which this pathogen can be spread and reach a susceptible banana plant and cause infection. So um, our detection will focus on when you want to find the fungus within one of these environmental sample types. Um, and one of the other reasons this is important is because the fungus does produce highly resistant spores, which can remain viable for, for decades in, for example, infected soil. Um, these spores are chlamydospores, which Altus explained earlier. Um, so they can remain in the soil and be spread throughout this entire area with water and with field equipment. Um, so the main reason that we want to detect the fungus is obviously to identify it very quickly. And um, with this, it's good to keep in mind that you can't necessarily test every piece of soil and every drop of water and every scrap of plant material. So it's not a guarantee that the, the fungus isn't there if you get a negative result. It simply means in the sample that you took, that you um, weren't able to detect the fungus. So sampling becomes really important when it comes to um, detection in field. So when we um, think of in-field detection, there are some methods which are used. So one of the more traditional methods is um, the use of colony forming units. Um, after growth on selective media. Now, this is a bit difficult for, for FOC simply because morphologically it's indistinguishable from other Fusarium oxysporum isolates. Um, so when you, when you do plate out a little bit of um, soil after dilution series or, or plant material, you can't be sure that every colony from a unit that you count is FOC. Um, and you would actually have to make sure that if you if you did think that was the case, using molecular techniques as a as a backup. Um, so for that reason, we actually um, we we do use CFUs, but more with other techniques and not alone. Um, we prefer to use molecular techniques such as um, loop mediated isothermal amplification or quantitative PCR, which will both um, both will be discussed briefly. Um, and the reason that we choose these molecular techniques is predominantly because for our pathogen, for, for FOC, you want to be sure that you are detecting FOC and not just a non-pathogenic Fusarium oxysporum isolate or um, an, a Fusarium oxysporum isolate that's a pathogen of another plant. So the accuracy is key in these techniques. So um, yeah, this is part of the disadvantages and advantages. Um, obviously with molecular techniques, you're using machinery and um, consumables and you need a, a greater amount of expertise. So it does become more expensive and a little more complicated to interpret your results. But at the end, the end of the day, you're more sure that what you are quantifying is FOC um, and that your results can be used um, in a quantitative way, so which is really helpful for statistics. Um, it's very sensitive and very rapid. Um, unfortunately, one of the, the issues with it is that if you wanted to look at viability, um, you will also have some DNA from non-viable cells, which is detected with a molecular technique. Um, this is obviously not a problem if you just want to see if the fungus is there. Um, and it depends on your research question. Um, but all in all, the, the techniques are very accurate, very sensitive, um, and work very efficiently for the detection of FOC. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit on a LAMP, which is a, a newer way of quantitative detection. Um, it is similar to PCR or polymerase chain reaction, um, but it occurs isothermally. So it's 60 to 70 degrees Celsius. And this is very helpful if you want to have a device um, for detection of your pathogen in field. 
um, it is not sensitive to inhibitors, um, but the, the lamp primers are a bit complex to design because there's about four to six of them and they, they really need to work well together um, because as the amplification occurs, you get a lot of these looping structures, um, which are a bit different from PCR where you just get one product and you know what that product is. So you need to make sure that your lamp is optimized to um, give you a good result as well. Um, the real lamp device is available um, and this works using the detection of fluorescence um, in a similar way that a qPCR, which we'll discuss later, does. Um, so this allows you to extract DNA from a sample such as infected plant or soil material, um, add the DNA to your lamp reaction mix and primers, and in real time see the quantity of um, pathogen DNA being detected. Um, with the real lamp device, a good consideration is that it only has a certain amount of samples, so about 16 samples um, or eight, depending on the model of the machine that you buy. And this means that um, although it's in field, you might not be able to do as many samples as if you took it back to the lab. Um, the, on the side here, we have some publications where they've used um, real lamp for the detection of FSC, mainly for tropical race four um, and race four isolates. Um, and predominantly for the detection in um, infected plant material, which is the, the easier um, background to work with. And there have been some publications with using LAMP for soil, but none of them have focused particularly on the, the sampling and making sure that the method is actually gonna give you a worthwhile result for detection from um, infected soil. Okay, so um, then we're gonna move on to qPCR which is um, more of a, an older technology, um, but therefore um, well trusted and widely used. So there's um, a greater body of, of work and publications that have used qPCR. And um, one of the reasons being that it's a bit simpler in terms of primer design, you can use your normal PCR primers or you can adapt them slightly um, just so that you get a smaller amplicon size. Um, and then the reaction happens as a normal PCR reaction would. The difference being that you have a fluorescent dye that is added or a, a probe. Um, and these enable you to um, get a fluorescent signature as DNA is amplified. Um, and that your um, qPCR machine will equate to the amount of, um, of pathogen DNA, if any, is in your sample. So um, let me see. Look at that. Um, so when you have a, a qPCR machine, you obviously can't take it to the field. It's a, it's a bigger machine. It's not isothermal. It has to cycle through different temperatures. Um, but you have a larger amount of samples that you can um, generate. So 72 to 96, depending on the model, um, samples can be done in about two hours. So um, your processing speed is quite quick. Um, when you have to um, interpret the results, it's a little bit more complicated than the general PCR and you have to be a little more careful because it's very, very sensitive. Like, you know, it picks up like 0 0.0003 nanograms per microliters of DNA. So if you aren't careful, you will get strange results. Um, so it's always helpful if you know someone who, who works with qPCR often and you get something strange or it looks like it's picking up on, on TOP or when it shouldn't. Um, to just double check and um, like Alter says, use other molecular techniques as well, that it's not just using one thing and then drawing a conclusion very quickly um, because all methods have some drawbacks. Okay, so um, looking at publications on um, qPCR assays for FOC, there have actually been quite a few and um, not just on RACE4 and PR4. Um, so here at Santa Marsh University, we actually looked at developing markers for qPCR um, for Lineage 6, which includes the, the race 1 and the race 2 isolates from Africa, as well as um, tropical race 4 and SDR4. And um, this is very helpful, specifically in, in our continents, that we can get an idea of um, where these different um, races or FOC isolates are and in a variety of materials. So whereas most um, articles look at the detection from plant material, we looked at um, infected plant material, infected soil, 
um, a little bit of environmental water. Um, and this is ongoing research that we're continually trying to improve our ability to um, tell how much of FOC um, TR4, for example, is in a specific environmental sample um, and use this in research to give um, quantitative results which can help us to figure out what the best way to manage the disease is. Um, yeah, so that's it's our publication, but there's also been some others. Um, and then lastly, I just want to talk about the challenges of environmental detection because it's not um, it's not always the easiest. Uh, and the reason being that your different environments naturally have some challenges associated with them. So for water, um, which I don't think there's currently any publication where they look at um, quantifying FOC from water, um, it's quite difficult in general to quantify from water because it's obviously a very large volume such as a dam and then you've got a tiny bit of pathogen inoculum dispersed. So the way that you sample that water has to be um, very efficient that you'll actually get enough of the pathogen to give a result. Um, next with plant. Um, so plant is not too difficult, but that is because normally we only sample from an infected plant with like very clear symptoms. Um, and that's, that's just to make sure that it's actually, um, it's gonna have a pathogen in it. Um, we're not um, confident yet that we can just take any plant without symptoms and, and figure out if it's infected or not. Um, and then with plant material, you do need to make sure that you use a good um, DNA extraction kit or a method because um, plant material and soil often have a lot of other microbes in them, including many um, non-pathogenic Fusarium oxysporum isolates and many um, closely related fungi, bacteria, viruses, it's all in there, as well as a lot of um, compounds like um, phenolics, which actually inhibits your DNA amplification and can cause you to get a negative result when it's a positive result. Um, and for this reason, when we develop a qPCR or someone works on a lamp, there's a lot of rigorous steps to make sure that you are um, giving people an assay which works in the given environment very well and um, is able to most of the time, like 99% of the time, give a result that makes sense. Um, and then lastly, in the soil, it's also very complex. Um, but you have lower levels of inoculum, obviously, than in an infected plant, because in the infected plant, the fungus is actively um, growing and multiplying, whereas in the soil, it kind of um, waits um, and it can diminish over time. So your distribution is going to be heterogeneous and perhaps small pockets of the pathogen. Um, and this combined with the complexity of the environment makes it quite difficult. Um, but like I said, we are continually working on um, optimizing our methods. And one of the things that we are looking very closely at is sampling to make sure that we are um, making a method that someone else can use and answer their research questions in a scientific and accurate way. Lastly, these are just some pictures where you can see that we have a lot of fun um, sampling from our different environmental types. So this is a a plantation infected with FOC TR4 and we took soil samples um, some from the pseudostem from roots and um, worked quite hard on, on seeing where we can find the fungus and how good we can be at quantifying it. Um, yeah, so please feel free to ask questions and I hope you enjoyed, enjoyed this presentation. Um, it was a, a pleasure to present. Thank you.